announcements. I want to welcome everybody to the services this morning. It's from tonight at 7 o'clock, Wednesday night at 7.30. Next Sunday, we will begin uh, Sunday school once again, and that will begin at 9.30 in the morning. And so all the other service hours will remain the same, uh, but we will add Sunday school to the mix. And um, uh, that way things will be backed up to... Uh, the way they were before the scandemic happened. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we'll also be taking our offering up the, the usual way uh, at that time as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, next month uh, we will be praying for Brother uh, Oxendine, pastor of Weststone Baptist Church in Bucyrus. So uh, that will be, and I'll have a, uh, hope to have a sign up sheet uh, by this evening if I can get a hold of him this afternoon and get some information from him along those lines. We may also be able to go back to live streaming uh, the services. Now that doesn't, you've already showed up, so that doesn't give you an excuse to stay home. Uh, but uh, uh, so those perhaps, and, and we'll test that out tonight and kind of get an idea of how that worked uh, after the fact, but uh, uh, we, we, I may have found uh, a workaround to the, the limitations uh, on that. Uh, let's see. I want to thank those that uh, were in prayer for us. We traveled Friday and yesterday, traveled down to Kentucky uh, Friday. Uh, let's see, Jay Lynn's future sister in law was getting married, and her fiance, she of course uh, speaks Spanish. She speaks English also, but all of her family and every and people they were close to were Spanish-speaking people, all of his family and people they were close to were English-speaking. And so they wanted somebody to uh, translate and interpret the wedding into English for his family's uh, and, and friends' benefit. And so they asked if I to do that, and they wanted Jay Lynn and, and uh, Ivan to sing a special and, and for my wife to play the piano for that. And so we went down uh, yesterday no, the day before yesterday, and for the rehearsal and, and whatnot, and then were there for the wedding yesterday, and then came back uh, after that. And so it was kind of a whirlwind of, of travel. And uh, but uh, thank you for your prayers, and we thank God for the safety He provided in that. Um, that's, that's all the announcements I have at this time. Please take your Bibles this morning. And open them with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. Philippians, chapter 3. And once you've found that, if you're able, if you'll stand with me for the reading of God's Word, we'll read verses 13 and... 14, I'll read verse 13 and, and invite you to read verse 14 out loud with me. Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. For its power and its its perfection, uh, thank you for bringing for it being the reason we are brought together today. Now, Lord, I pray that you would honor your word and that it would accomplish that which you sent it forth to do. That its power would be uh, unleashed upon us today and within us as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name for His sake. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> In uh, verse 13, we find this phrase here, this one thing I do. This one thing I do. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That means, uh, if I can just paraphrase a little bit, he says, I don't consider myself to have arrived. Uh, I'm not perfect yet. I'm not, I'm not where I would like to be. Uh, he said, but... This one thing I do. Uh, it would be very easy to make a very strong argument for the Apostle Paul being perhaps the best Christian 
that we have record of throughout the New Testament. And um, maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he called himself the chiefest of sinners. Uh, but uh, uh, what we can certainly be sure of is he was used very greatly by God. And him being used by God during his lifetime didn't stop with his lifetime as God used him as a pen to record much scripture for much of the New Testament uh, was God used Paul to write that and preserved it for us to this very day. And so his willingness and his yieldedness to God and his being used by God is still having an effect on the entire planet to this very day and upon our lives as well. Just the fact that we are here, we read from this, that's having an effect on us. We won't leave here exactly the same as we came, as we arrived. And, and there's something that he said that he did. And he said, this one thing I do. This one thing I do. And he says, I, I, uh, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Here's what's the one thing that he does. What's the one thing that he said he did? Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so he says, I press for the high calling of God. I press for the high calling. The one thing I do, he said, there's some other things that, that, that uh, are, are kind of incidental to this, but this is the one thing I do. And, and those other things are supportive of this, but the only reason I do them is for this one thing. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. And so I, I got to think about that. Okay, well, what is what is the high calling of God? And some people say, well, that's uh, uh, he was called to be a preacher. And, and uh, yes, very clearly, he was called by Jesus Christ himself as he was on the road and, and traveling and he was on his way to persecute Christians and, and Jesus appeared unto him in a bright shining light, blinded him, took away his sight for several days and, and uh, had a, a, a very serious conversation with him there on that road and he said, why are you persecuting me? And, and he said, well, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. And, and that was where, where Paul got saved. And he went on into town where God told him to go and, and waited there. And then God sent a, a preacher over and said, you need to baptize him. And, and uh, he, he said, uh, he's the one that's been persecuting us. He wants to arrest us and, and throw us in jail or worse. And, and um, uh, uh, But he got saved. He got his life transformed. And he gave it to God and began very zealously using that energy and knowledge and everything he had for the cause of Christ, whereas before he had given all of his energy and devotion against the cause of him, very sincerely, uh, very sincerely, but, but very much so against it. What was that high calling? Was it his call to preach? No, <clears throat> it wasn't. Because if that was the case, we could say, well, that portion of Scripture isn't for me. I haven't been called to preach. I haven't been called to pastor. What was that high calling? There was something that was higher than, than the calling to preach and the calling to pastor, than the calling to start churches and, and train men to be preachers and, and take over those works so he could go somewhere else and do the same thing again. If we back up a little bit, we find it tucked away here in verse 10. <clears throat> the first few words in that verse are, that I may know him. And this is talking about Jesus. In the chapter, the context of this chapter is Paul saying how important the relationship with Jesus is. And he talks about the great things and the achievements that, that uh, he had in his life, uh, his credentials, if you will, the things that he had suffered, the things that he had gone through. And he said, you know, all those great things and, and the achievements that I had, he said, I count it all but done. He said, it's all absolutely worthless. Everything of value has been removed from it compared to my relationship with Christ, compared to what Jesus is in my life. And he says, here's this. Here's the main thing. Here's my goal. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. That was his desire. Well, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. What was the high calling of God? That I may know him. That I may know him. Uh, throughout, the, I, I looked up in the uh, uh, calling of God. 
And the Bible says that God calls us to fellowship, that God calls us into his kingdom. And, and the, uh, the context was always a calling unto salvation, a calling unto a relationship with God, a calling into his family, a calling into, into, uh, into his kingdom, if you will. And, and the Bible says here that I may know him. That's the high calling. And that's what every Christian should be pressing towards. <clears throat> Turn with me to Mark chapter 3, if you will. An interesting thing here. Mark chapter 3. And, and Jesus is, is getting ready to begin his earthly ministry. And look at verse 14 there. And he ordained twelve. So we know who, who he's talking about. He ordained twelve that they should be with him. That was the first purpose that he called them out. That they should be with him. And that he might send them forth to preach. But the first thing he wanted was for them to be with him. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great that the Son of God wants us to be with him? I don't know about you. I know me, and, and that that's shocking to me. <laughs> that that, that tell, I get goosebumps when I get to think about that, that God himself wants me to be with him. And there's a whole lot of people here who wouldn't care for my company at all. And that's all right because God wants me to be with him. There's a whole lot of people here who wouldn't want me to be around that, that know me and would see me and go a different direction. I don't, want to, I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to be around him. And that's, you know, who cares about that when the God of all creation, Almighty God, wants me to be with him. And he came to this earth and he said, hey... Uh, you know, I need some preachers, but, but that's secondary. The first thing I want is, fellas, I want you to be with me. And this, this idea, this concept, this philosophy or way of thinking goes all the way back to the very beginning in the book of Genesis when we see God coming in the cool of day looking for fellowship with Adam and Eve, the pinnacle of his creation, those whom he had created in his own image. And he said, I want to spend some, Adam, where are you? Adam, it's, it's our appointment. We're supposed to meet right here in this beautiful garden that I created just for you. And, and I've given you so much freedom and liberty in it. And, and way back in Genesis, God sought and desired the fellowship of man and everything between Genesis and the cross of Calvary is God developing his plan and working it out so that the goal could be achieved that man could once again be with God, that fellowship could be restored. And he sent the angels at the birth of Christ, and they said, peace and goodwill toward men. Not among men, but toward men. They said, the Son of God is here, and God is doing that. He's demonstrating his peace and goodwill towards you. He, they're saying God doesn't hate you and God doesn't, uh, he's not angry with you to where he wants to send you to hell. He has goodwill towards you and he's sending the prince of peace himself here that we should be with him. And Paul said, the one thing I do, the one thing I do, he said this under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, the one thing I do, this one thing I do, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It's a shame that so much of Christianity gets distracted from Christ, the Christ of Christianity. And so much of Christianity gets marked up and it's easy to get it to get caught up in the do's and the don'ts and everything. And, and that's not where the focus and I'm I'm for rules, I'm for doing right, and I'm against doing wrong. But the, the main thing 
should be the pursuit of a relationship with Christ. It shouldn't be I got saved and that's it. It should be I got saved and the Bible tells us it commands us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what it has to be about. It has to be about our connection and our relationship with Jesus. All through, that's, that's, that's the purpose of the whole Bible. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. You see, once you get to know Him, you, you, you can't help but get to know more about the power of His resurrection. And all of us have been touched by death in some way or another. And it might be the, the physical death of somebody that we're close to, but there's a lot of other things that die. There's a lot of other deaths that touch us also. It could be the death of a relationship. What do we need? We need to know Him and the power of His resurrection. All those things that are lost causes, well, that's all right. God has the power of resurrection. And that's a wonderful thing. That's, that's a, uh, the ultimate hope. The blessed hope. The, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. I don't have anything good to bring to the table. But He does. His righteousness. And thank God He imputes that righteousness to us. And, and, and in so doing, He imputed our sinfulness unto, uh, upon Jesus. And Jesus became sin who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And we can stand before God justified without sin, without blood, without any stain on our, on our record, on our account. And, and this one thing that we're to do, the one thing, uh, let's get our focus back on the main thing and get our attention on Jesus. On Jesus. And how everything needs to come back to Jesus. How everything needs to be brought to Jesus. And how Jesus needs to be brought to everyone. And everything. I was uh, I was watching um, a couple YouTube videos this week, and and um, there's a guy that, that I saw on there, and I thought, I, there's there's one thing I have again. I just wish he was a King James, used a King James Bible uh, for what he did. But but what struck me was that um, <clears throat> he was he was out out and about witnessing, and spent a lot of time in Utah and. Of course, they video everything and, and, and just witnessing to Mormons. And then he had, a, he had a, 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 an incident where this Mormon got saved. And then later on, he kind of interviewed him. What would you say to other Mormons and other uh, Mormon missionaries and so on and so forth? And the Mormon was, using, was quoting everything out of the King James Bible. Um, and I thought, well, at least he'll go out and witness to him with, with the Word of God and everything. But, but what really struck me was the man's the man had a real good spirit in speaking to people, and and he wasn't so harshly adversarial. But he was he very much showed the love of Jesus, and he kept bringing it back. and And, and the point he kept driving home is one that I've made many times: is that they have a different Jesus. the 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 Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses is not the Jesus of the Bible. The, the Jesus of Islam is not the Jesus of the Bible. See, the Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is a created angel. The Mormons say the Mormon Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. The Jesus of Islam was just a prophet. The Jesus of the Bible is the Son of God Himself, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The one who rose again from the conquered death was victorious over it and now is seated at the right hand of the Father, equal with God, because He is God. He was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He, in the beginning, uh, I was reading this one day and, and, and I thought, wow, here's one little word that's past tense. In the beginning, was. So, when the beginning happened, he had already been there. 
He already was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So if you go out on the timeline, go down the timeline, right here's the beginning. Well, before that, Jesus was already there. He didn't start there. He already was there. God the Father already was there. And God the Holy Spirit was already there. And the Bible tells us that as Christians, there's something we ought to be pressing towards. And it's always towards a higher relation, a better relationship that I may know Him. Getting to know Jesus better. Getting to know Jesus better. And it's a shame that so many Christians neglect the Old Testament because he, there are so many pictures there painted of him. Now we don't have to hold on to those pictures. We can look at them and say, I'm glad I have the real thing. There's a whole lot of people that hold on to those pictures and, and uh, they're missing out on the real thing. See, if, if you're not with somebody, you have to make do with a picture. But once you have that person, you'd be silly to hold on to that picture and hug it and kiss the picture and, and not hug your spouse. <laughs> and hug them and kiss on them. We don't, we don't have to hold to those pictures anymore, but it's, it's nice to have them. It's nice to pull out that box of old pictures from time to time. We're to press for that fellowship. We're to press for that relationship. Something mentioned here is, the Bible tells us there's a powerful tool that Satan will use against us. That he'll use to keep us from pressing, from continuing forward, from, from desiring that, from focusing on that, from making that the one thing, the one thing, the one thing, the one thing. Verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, back in, in Philippians 3, but this one thing I do. And then kind of in a, in a little parenthesis here, it's not in parentheses, but it's between two commas. He says, Forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So he's describing how he presses. How do you press towards the high, the, the high calling? Uh, how do you press toward the mark uh, for the prize of the high calling of God? How do you press towards that, that uh, stronger relationship with Jesus? Getting to know Him better and growing, not just in grace, but in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, we do it by forgetting those things which are behind. The, there's a powerful tool that Satan will use to keep you from growing your relationship with Jesus, and it's your past. It's your past. I wrote, I wrote myself a note a while back, and it said this. It said, and I, I imagine I read this somewhere or heard somebody say it, and, and I wish I would, I would have written down who I heard say it or where I read it. But anyways, it says this. Don't hold on to a mistake just because you spent a lifetime making it. My wife may have said that. I don't, know. <laughs> don't hold on to a mistake just because you spent a lifetime making it. Let me also say don't hold on to a sin just because you spent a lifetime committing it. People that aren't married and they, they've been shacking up for 20, 30 years. Well, I don't see any sense in getting married now. Don't hold on to a sin just because you spent a lifetime making it. And mistakes come from many different, many different sources. Some mistakes come from simple tradition. We've just always done it this way. A, uh, our family has done things this way for generations and generations, as far back as any of us can remember. Well, don't hold on to a mistake just because you spent a lifetime making it. Well, our families had family reunions Sunday morning, uh, the first Sunday of August in the morning, ever since anybody can remember. Well, you don't have to hold on to a mistake just because generations have been making it. And you spent your own lifetime making that mistake. Uh, some mistakes come from simple ignorance. People make a mistake because they don't know anybody. 
if I were to if I were to try to sew a shirt, there would be a lot of mistakes made because I I'm ignorant as far as how to sew a shirt. Now some very simple things I may have been able to sew thirty some years ago when I was in home ec class and the teacher was right there and, and she had many helpers to, to help us learn how to sew. The girl said, it's not fair, boys get a whole year of study hall and we have to take home ec. And so in uh, seventh grade, they decided to have home ec for the boys for one semester and uh, they called it singles living. <laughs> and I was thinking, I hope all seventh grade boys are single. <laughs> But they were prepared. They, uh, maybe, or maybe it wasn't because the girls complained. Maybe the principal looked at those boys, at us boys, and said, there's no hope of them ever getting married. We better prepare them, teach them how to do some sewing and cooking uh, while they're here. I'm glad he was wrong, at least about me. But uh, uh, <clears throat> ignorance. Simple. I, people just don't know, and they'll make a mistake. Sometimes the, the, the wires in the brain get crossed, and... A few months back, I, I needed to change the oil in my truck, so I climbed under with a wrench, and, and I, I pulled the plug out, and instead of it coming out black, it came out red, and I said, that was the wrong plug. <laughs> that, that was not the oil. <laughs> and then I looked over, and about uh, 24 inches away from that plug was another plug, and I said, that's, that's the one I wanted. <laughs> And so I said uh, to my wife, I said, I need to go to uh, the car parts store and I need to get some transmission fluid and I'm going to need to get a, a hand pump to put it in because that truck doesn't have a place where you can check the transmission fluid and add any. It's all sealed up and, and it's a complicated, some dumb guy sitting behind a desk thought it'd be a good idea to make it that way. A uh, guy that's never going to have to work on him himself. But that was just a simple mistake. A, a, a momentary lapse of knowledge, uh, a, a momentary overwhelming of ignorance. Some mistakes. Mistakes aren't always necessarily sinful, but they can be harmful. And if that mistake hadn't been corrected, it would have been very damaging to, to the vehicle. Some mistakes are made simply because everybody around is making the same mistake. Peer pressure. And, and they may be ignorant that it's a mistake and, and people just get caught up and I'm just, I'm just doing this because that's the way I've seen everybody else do it. Some mistakes are made simply because of wrong teaching. People have been taught wrong. Mistakes can be made very sincerely. The Apostle Paul, before he was Paul while he was still yet Saul and breathing out threatenings against the Christians. He was very sincere. He felt he was doing God's work in trying to eradicate the world of this, this plague called Christianity. And these false teachers and false believers and, and how they were having a bad effect on the Jews and, and drawing people away from the true God. And he was very sincere in his actions and the fact is the depth of sincerity can make it the deeper the sincerity oftentimes the harder to let go of that mistake and he had to have something very severe happen to him to get his attention I mean he was stopped everybody that he was with got the I mean just stopped in their tracks a uh, bright light shining from heaven the voice of the Son of God himself speaking from heaven. He winds up blinded. The men around him, they hear a voice, but they can't make out what's being said. They see the light, but they don't know what's going on. And it's very pinpointed and very specifically directed at, at Saul. Because something simple, something easy, something light... would not have pulled him out of that mistake. Why? He had devoted a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of himself was poured in. Hey, just because you've spent a lifetime making a mistake doesn't mean you have to continue to hold on to it. The 
The Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. There's many lies that he tells us. One of them is, your past mistakes have a hold on you. That's not true. Your, your, your sins of your past have a hold on you. My Bible tells me 